Good evening and welcome to Pray Vote Stand. I'm your host, Tony Perkins, president of the Family Research Council. Tonight, while it's becoming more difficult to openly follow Jesus in America, in other places around the globe, it's never been more dangerous. For 80% of the world's Christians, this isn't a once in a while threat. This is an every second of every day nightmare that they endure to follow Jesus Christ. Their stories may be unique, but their prayers are all the same, that their brothers and sisters in the faith here in the United States will step in and help stop their suffering. In just a bit, we'll talk with two men who have made their life's mission to do just that. Former Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, and former Congressman Frank Wolf, who has spent decades fighting religious persecution around the world. We'll talk about what America's influence means to our brothers and sisters in chains, and finally, as most of us read the horrifying headlines miles away from places like Nigeria, North Korea, India, and Iran, we want to know what can ordinary believers do? Well, Pastor Steve Berger is here to explain how he challenged his community to take a more active role helping the persecuted church. But first, became a Christian. My beliefs turned against me. I no longer belong. In China, the government installed facial recognition cameras in our sanctuary. That camera can gather the private data of our church members. They will intimidate them, they will prevent them from going to church. That means an Akashi Krista one of the so in a gani domin Christanchi in a kimi. For most Americans, their crimes are things we take for granted every day. Opening a Bible, praying in public, driving to and from church. But for 340 million people around the world, even uttering the word Jesus could earn them a life sentence if they're lucky, and a death sentence if they're not. Even the simplest expressions of faith, habits most of us don't give a second thought, could exact the ultimate price. It's a constant terror that countless men, women, and children are willing to endure, all for the sake of Jesus Christ. It's been called a slow motion war, a silent slaughter, but whatever you call it, the difficult reality of being a disciple of Jesus is one of the most undertold stories of the modern age. Here in the West, we see flashes of the unspeakable atrocities in places like Nigeria, where, by the way, just this week, another 140 children vanished from their Baptist school, ripped away from their deaths by armed terrorists, leaving inconsolable families behind. Together, they're part of the 1,000 kidnapping victims this country has seen just since December. A lost generation in Nigeria may never get back. In places like North Korea, thousands of sons and daughters are growing up never knowing their parents are Christians, a secret that is painstakingly kept for their own protection. Because believing in Jesus, as survivors like Hey Wu know, is enough to get anyone killed. 예수 믿는 사람들을 그 예수란 말만 해도 하나님이란 말만 해도 예수 그것은 북한에서는 세상에서 가장 나쁜 사람들은 예수 믿는 사람들이라고 했고 또 감옥에 있을 때 특히 감옥에서 정말 많은 사람들이 옆에서 죽어가고 항상 주님께서 내 마음에 기둥이 되고 나의 마음에 등재가, 등대가 되어주시고 감사하고 
그래서 항상 이 노래를 부를 때마다 Not everyone lives to tell their story. According to Open Doors, 4,761 Christians were killed for their faith last year. That's one martyr every two hours. Nine of each ten were from Africa, the deadliest continent on earth for followers of Jesus Christ. In the darkest corners of the world, some will die without anyone knowing, victims of a brutal war that almost no one in the world is talking about. While the pandemic raged, so did religious hostility. 4,488 churches and Christian buildings were attacked, a heartbreak that the Middle East knows quite well. In Mosul, for instance, along the Nineveh Plains, the ancient streets are filled with grim reminders of ISIS's march through Iraq, the rubble of old sanctuaries, charred crosses, and mounds of jagged debris. If it weren't for the Trump administration, most people think we might have seen the end of Christianity in that region of the world. Now, thanks to the policies he put in place and millions of dollars in aid, there are signs of life, new shops, a school, old churches rebuilt from ashes. To believers watching from around the world, the area's revival has been a beacon of hope, a reminder of the resilience of the Christian faith and how we here in the United States can be a part of something with eternal significance, keeping the torch of religious freedom burning. But unfortunately, President Biden has been far less adamant about America's legacy of leading on religious liberty. Six months into his administration, persecuted Christians are still waiting for some sign that this president is willing to look beyond his borders for anything but climate change. While this White House whittles away the hours on greenhouse gases, believers everywhere are crying out for the world to remember that the deadliest environment is made by the tyrants of religious intolerance. Their stories should not only drive our leaders to act, they should drive us as fellow believers to our knees. First, in gratitude that we have the freedom so many Christians long for, but also in solidarity with the courageous people standing for Christ in the face of torture, loss, imprisonment, and yes, even death. The church needs to act. It needs to advocate. And above all else, we need to pray. And that is how we will begin our time together tonight. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to join together across this country and literally around the world, to pray for the persecuted, those who follow you and for that reason alone find themselves some in chains, some deprived of their livelihood, persecuted, and some even killed. We pray for the families, Lord, of those that are suffering under the repressive nature of evil governments. And Lord, I pray that here in the United States, while we face growing opposition, that Lord, we would be bold in living out our faith for you, that, Lord, those in faraway places would have the opportunity of freedom because we were willing to stand in the face of opposition to the Christian faith. And may we advocate for them, may we pray for them, and may we work, Lord, that all men, women, and children in all places would have the freedom to believe. And we pray and ask that you would be with us tonight in our conversations. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The West is waking up to the crisis of Christian persecution, and a lot of that has to do with my next guest. For four years, the Trump administration, led by Mike Pompeo and Ambassador Sam Brownback, made religious freedom a priority around the world. While the international church prayed, they acted, fighting for the rights of every person in every country to exercise their faith without fear. Religious freedom, the former senator said, is a battle he'll never give up. And he's here tonight to share how America's involvement could mean life or death for Christians around the globe. Sam, welcome to Pray, Vote, Stand. Hey, thanks, Tony. It's always a pleasure to join you. And I've watched your 
videos as we lead up to this, it just really continues to just grip my heart uh, that that all these people are suffering so many places. And, and we need to act and we need to do something about it. And we need to continue to act and press forward on this grave human rights uh, abuse that continues to take place around the world and continues to be really under underreported, underseen, and uh, and needs to be highlighted and addressed by the global community. Um, Sam, I want to ask you about that. Is you, you served as a, a member of the House of Representatives, you served as a senator, and then you were ambassador at large for religious freedom. What causes or what is it, that, what's the obstacle that keeps the media from really focusing on this? And even the objection when you raise the fact that it is, uh, well, there's religious persecution across the board, Christians seem to be the primary target. Why is there opposition to these facts? I wish I, I wish I had a good answer for you. Uh, Tony, too much of the time, it almost seems like it's because you are Christians. Uh, and this is the largest uh, religion in the world, and you guys are big enough to take care of yourself. Uh, and and it, it's it's like you know that they there's some willfulness to it, uh, just not willing to admit that this uh, takes place. There's a uh, a desire to say, well, uh, we're just not going to address this. We've got other things. The, the, although the root thing that that Secretary Pompeo and I tried to really address a lot was this just isn't, isn't about religious persecution. It just isn't about Christian persecution. This is about the foundations for a democracy. This is about foundations of human rights. You get this one right, you can build human rights on it. You get this one wrong, they will deteriorate in other places. Uh, and I think that's what we really end up having to step back to is just to get to this foundational piece of it being a human right that is critically important to building open and democratic societies. That is certainly one element of this focus on religious freedom for all people. Uh, but I want you, uh, Ambassador, for just a moment, speak to, as, a, as a, we're believers, we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But from that understanding, we advocate for all people to have yeah. religious freedom. Uh, because we want, just as God gave us that freedom, uh, gave man that freedom in the garden to, to choose, we want men, women, and children to have that opportunity to choose to follow God or not. It, it is absolutely fundamental. And it's fundamental as a person of faith. Uh, God gave me the human dignity to be able to choose him or to deny him. Now I follow Jesus and I'm delighted to do that. I. Uh, I don't know how well I would do under the persecution that I see in other places in the world, but that's part of my fundamental dignity as an individual is that key choice. And to me, it's the biggest choice you make in your life. We think other people around the world have to be given that same right, and no government has the right to interfere with that. And communal violence doesn't have the right to interfere with that, even though those are things that people have to have to fight through in so many places around the world. Uh, but this, to me, is a fundamental piece of, of our faith. It's that dignity that I have that right to choose God or not. And, and everybody is entitled to that around the world. And we will fight for that right for everybody around the world, whether we agree with their theology or not. And, and as you, uh, you, you mentioned a moment ago, that is really a cornerstone of all freedom. If a society, if a country, a nation, a people respects, protects religious freedom, we see so much flow from that. It, it is. It's the basic. It reminds me of the old Vince Lombardi uh, story, a legendary coach for the Green Bay Packers. He would start every season out with holding up a football, and he would say, this man is a football. You know, and one time, one of their uh, star athletes said, coach, slow down. You're going a little fast for me. But the point of it was you start with the basics. Well, this is a basic. You get this one wrong, and you're going to have trouble with freedom of assembly. You're going to have trouble with freedom of speech. You're going to have trouble with all these other things. <clears throat> you get this one right, you can build an open society. And the genocides in the world today and in recent times mostly are of religious minorities. You can reduce the amount of violence in the world if you will simply protect 
this fundamental right of a dignified individual that they have under the UN Human Rights Charter, that they have under our Constitution, and more importantly, they have from our Creator. Well, you could also throw into their economic freedom uh, because we see strong, vibrant economies uh, coming from those societies that respect this fundamental human right. Uh, Ambassador, this is something that has long marked your professional career, your public career, and it's not left you. Uh, you are now spearheading another event uh, or another a movement, I should say, focused on international religious freedom. And next week, there will be a summit in Washington, D.C. Tell our viewers about that. Well, this is the first ever uh, civil society led summit of international about international religious freedom. It's going to be July 13th to 15th in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're sold out. Uh, we have got 90 some speakers uh, coming to the event, and it's really about galvanizing and synergizing the global network. We'll have people from all the various major religions in the world. They'll be speaking. The topic is one topic, religious freedom for everybody, everywhere, all the time. And what we're trying to do is to get the religious leaders to stand up for each other's religious freedom. Uh, and if we can do that, we really, I think, can move this movement forward, grassroots, around the world, uh, and get this really in, ensconced in many more countries as a, as a real practice, uh, not one that people just say, well, yeah, we got religious freedom here, but they really don't. Uh, we want this to take root and to be a reality for most people in the world, and today it is not. Uh, Ambassador, one final uh, question. I know the, the, the summit next week is, uh, is sold out, but this is not the end. It's just the beginning of this effort. How can uh, people find out more about what you're doing and what you hope to accomplish on the international religious freedom front? They can go to our website, IRF Summit, IRF Summit, International Religious Freedom Summit, uh, we will have then meetings on these topics. We've got a charter. We'll have specific items that we're going after on policy changes, like uh, ending the death penalty for apostasy and blasphemy laws, bringing down the Chinese firewall on the Internet so that they can get free access to the Internet. And we'll push those policy issues throughout the year. If people want to join us on that, if they want to pray about that, they can watch it. Uh, they can attend if they've registered already. Uh, but they can watch it online at that IRF Summit uh, website and then stay tuned into it, into the policy initiatives that move forward after the summit. All right, Ambassador Brownback, I want to thank you for joining us. And as we uh, close out our discussion on this, would you, uh, would you pray over next week's summit and uh, the objectives uh, and the goals of the summit? Happy to, Tony. Um, everybody join, us, join me in prayer. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for giving us freedom and the freedom to choose. And Christ came to give us freedom, and you did. And we seek freedom for everybody everywhere around the world. So, Lord, we pray you bless this summit. We pray you build authentic relationships between people, loving relationships, because friends, they solve problems. Strangers don't. Enemies don't. Friends solve problems. And we build these relationships to move this grassroots movement of religious freedom forward around the world through all the religious uh, views and beliefs. This isn't about a common faith or theology. It is about a common human right and that we would stand for each other's human rights here to seek and pursue God as we see fit. So bless the effort. Guide us. Give us wisdom and discernment and great favor with governments and leaders around the world that this right might become a reality. This religious freedom right would be a reality for people all over the world. And I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. No one has worked harder than my next guest in advocating for the persecuted. Religious persecution and those suffering under the tyrannical governments uh, across the world. Uh, representing the state of Virginia, Congressman Frank Wolf served 
uh, a long time in Congress as an advocate for the persecuted. In fact, the current law that oversees the federal government's participation in international religious freedom is named the Frank Wolf Act. And uh, he joins us now. Congressman Frank Wolf, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Tony. Good to be with you. And thanks for your good work and appreciate it. Well, you have been tracking this issue before many even knew it was a problem, uh, going all the way back to the, the USSR and the persecution that was taking place there. Uh, we, we're almost kind of seeing full circle coming around. Where do you think we are today when you, you look at the last four decades? I think we're in one of the darkest times that we've been in really since uh, I would say the 70s, uh, very, very dark for several reasons. One, the church has been silent. Uh, now, there are some exceptions, but overall, the church in the United States has been relatively silent. Secondly, we don't have Chuck Colson's and we don't have uh, William Wilberforce's and Dietrich Bonhoeffer's and people like that to motivate the church. If you look to see what's taking place, Nigeria, you mentioned Nigeria. The UN just came out with figures last week, 350,000 Nigerians, mainly Christians, have been killed, have been killed since 2020. Boko Haram has killed more Nigerian Christians than ISIS has killed in Iraq and Syria combined, killing everybody. And yet, the numbers come out from the UN, I haven't had one person in the church make any comment about it. Secondly, I, I hate to say this, but I think on, on this issue, uh, there's just not the interest. And if you look to see where America, when America ceases to be engaged, the world becomes a much more uh, dangerous, dangerous place. Uh, China, every denomination, Catholic Church, Protestant Church, Tibetan Buddhists, there's genocide there. The Uyghurs are going through genocide. The Falun Gong, they're taking their kidneys out. We hear very little really comment about it. I mean, the, many of the business interests in the West are more concerned with what the Chinese government think of them than they are what the Congress and this administration or American government thinks, thinks of them. You look to see the, the China, what they're doing. Russia, what they're doing. You mentioned, I saw you had the film of, uh, of Mosul. In order to get to Mosul, you fly to Erbil. Ur the Erbil base was just attacked yesterday by, by the Iranians. The Chinese are on, on, on the move. They're threatening Thai, Taiwan. They literally have taken over Hong Kong. Most of the, the reporters with Apple Daily, the newspaper there, have been, have been arrested. Many of the Christian leaders who have spoken out have been, have been arrested. We see Russia aggressively moving ahead, just ransomware. We don't even know how to really act. I think we're seeing a very dark dark period of time. Let me give you one other example. Afghanistan, whether you, whether you favor withdrawing or you're not, but we are literally pulled out of Bagram Air Force Base. If you looked at the news yesterday, Bagram was the only place that we could have aided the Afghan government. It's the only place we could have evacuated from. It's the only place we could have fixed the aircraft from. It's the only place we could have brought aircraft in to help the Afghan military, and we're out. And if you looked at the news, we left in the middle of the night. We didn't even tell the Afghan commander that we were leaving. They woke up in the morning, and we were, and we were gone. So it's, it's almost like this administration cares more about people that are sneaking across the border in, in Mexico, many from strange, strange countries, than they do about the Afghan people who helped us. Who, who were interpreters for us. There are 17,000 or more who work with our American military. Their lives are in danger. Their families are in, are in danger. I mean, how are they going to get out? We've given Bagram up. So I, I think uh, we're seeing bleak things. We're seeing growing anti-Semitism all over the world and even here in the United States. So I think we're seeing a very, very difficult time. I pulled together a quote. In Ecclesiastes 4.1, it says, again, I looked. I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power is on the side of the oppressed. Well, power now is on the side of the money interest, 
power is on the side of those controlling the narrative. Power is on the side of the corporate elite who want to do business. America, I think, on this issue is facing decline. And that's just the reality of it. It can change. You remember President Reagan, who I thought was one of our greatest presidents, said the words in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, and the words in the Constitution were a covenant, not only with the people in Philadelphia in 1776 and 1787 when the Constitution was ratified, but a covenant with the entire world. I will tell you that covenant now has been breached. It's almost been ripped up. And I think we're fundamentally failing. So I think this is going to be a very difficult time unless there's a dramatic change. And the change, I think, should begin from the church. And unfortunately, we're not hearing it. Sam Brownback was talking about the, the summit, which you'll be a part of next week. I'll see you there uh, at that uh, International Religious Freedom Summit. The previous administration, the Trump administration, uh, under uh, Secretary Pompeo, the State Department made religious freedom, international religious freedom, one of their top foreign policy objectives, trying to, you know, you know how it is, trying to get that down through uh, every layer of the State Department. But this administration, not so much so. In fact, uh, almost silent on this issue. That's why this is a civil so society summit next week, because the federal government is not doing anything about it. And I have a clip here from uh, now Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken uh, about his view on religious freedom. Uh, there is no hierarchy that makes some rights more important than others. Past unbalanced statements that suggest such a hierarchy including those offered by a recently disbanded State Department Advisory Committee, do not represent a guiding document for this administration. At my confirmation hearing, I promised that the Biden-Harris administration would repudiate those unbalanced views. We do so decisively today. I mean, that, no hierarchy. I mean, go right ahead. I mean, that just, that resonated with religious people all over the world. That's basically America saying, we will no longer engage. If it had not been for the Trump, Pence, and probably more for Vice President Pence, we would have lost Christianity in the cradle of the Christendom, Iraq. It was, it was Vice President Pence that changed the policy. All our aid was going through the UN. He changed it. And the fact is, I was there with, with uh, uh, Sam Brownback, and we were part of that group to come back. They saved Christianity in the cradle of Christendom. They stopped ISIS. They literally stopped what the ISIS was doing to the to the Yazidi community, when they heard those words, when those words are heard in, in Nigeria, if, if what was taking place in Nigeria was taking place in Scandinavia or some other place, the world would be up and on. So that was basically a silent retreat. And then when they see what's taking place in Afghanistan, we're not even aiding the Afghans that helped us. They see that we're not standing up to China when they're bringing the uh, Muslims, they're, they're treating them like almost like they did in concentration camps during during World War II with the Nazis. We're seeing what's taking place in, in the Tibetans. We're seeing what's taking place in the Catholic Church. We're seeing what's taking place in, in many. They say, wow, does anyone care? And I think it's basically a retreat. And if I'm not saying they're going to retreat. I hope they got a good plan. We're not criticizing the president. I think he has got it. But I hope they put a good person in to be that ambassador like Ambassador Brownback or like David as Saperstein, somebody who's aggressive. And I think it can help. Hopefully somebody, I would hope all the religious freedom groups would meet with Blink and say, Mr. Blinken, you're wrong. That's not the policy. But that was a terrible statement for the Secretary of State to say. Uh, clearly, this is one of the areas of sharp contrast between the previous administration and this administration. But let's talk, Congressman Frank Wolf about the way forward as Americans. I mean, the elections are frustrating. We have a current administration that seems to be indifferent, but we're not without hope. As you said, this really needs to come up from the church. Well, we're, we're obviously not without hope. I mean, things are very bleak in the past and all of a sudden you can, you can turn it around. One, I think you got it. You got, you ought to have a group go see the president on this issue. You ought to have a group write a letter or contact them. See, please put somebody like David Sacristine or Ambassador Brown back in to be the ambassador because you, that office was sort of the focal point. Everything came in through that office. Thirdly, we should prohibit, we should prohibit lobbyists in this town representing interest. The number of lobbyists that are now out working for the Chinese interest 
companies in China that are doing terrible things. We should we should ban ban that. But I think for the church to wake up, we really need Colsons. We need Wilberforces. We need, and I think they're out there. But for some reason, this is it doesn't resonate the way that it used to a few years ago. Well, as we uh, wrap up our discussion here, uh, Congressman Wolf, I'm going to ask you to pray for that very thing, that we would see a stirring in the church, uh, that uh, we would see those that would step into the public arena with a passion like you've had, the passion of uh, Chris Smith, of, of uh, Sam Brownback and others, uh, but that there would be a whole choir of voices uh, crying out for the persecuted. Dear Lord, we pray for a Congress full of Christmas. We pray that there be Christmas in the Republican Party, Christmas in the Democratic Party. We we pray for a church, uh, uh, the Christian church, to be full of Wilberforces, to be full of people like Chuck Colson, who was so passionate about this issue. We pray that there be Bonhoeffers, people that would speak out against this persecution, speak, people speak out against anti-Semitism. We pray, too, that there'll be pastors and political leaders who will be willing to go to jail for what they believe, who will literally be able to stand outside the, uh, the, the State Department and pick it and say, we care deeply. We pray that there'll be people that will speak in this administration to help the Nigerian Christians and the others in Nigeria. We pray that there'll be people who will be so motivated to help the Uyghurs, to help the Buddhist Tibetans, to help the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church. We pray, and we know it can happen, because we believe, I believe, what President Reagan said, the words in the Constitution, the words in the Declaration of Independence were a covenant, not only with the people in America back in the revolutionary days, but a covenant with the entire world. I pray there will be people in leadership of both political parties that will reestablish, that will strengthen that covenant, whereby we can bring freedom and liberty and dignity for all people all over the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For over 30 years, Steve Berger's career has been marked by purpose and passion. He is the founding pastor of Tennessee's Grace Chapel, and he now serves as the CEO and president of Ambassador Services International, a ministry for government leaders. For years, he and his wife, Sarah, have had a heart for the world's persecuted. They've become very involved in the Middle East, financially supporting Christians in Mosul after ISIS attacked, and also working with U.S. leaders to get believers relocated to safe countries. He's seen the devastation on the ground in places like Turkey and Syria and Iraq. And he's here to tell us what practical steps the church can take to support our brothers and sisters overseas. Pastor Steve, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Great to be with you, Tony. Always a pleasure. Well, let's start right where I left off with Congressman Frank Wolf, who is obviously passionate about this and has been working for decades and uh, he and I have had many, many conversations uh, over my 20 years in, in Washington uh, about the, uh, the, the absence of the, church, the church's voice. And I know, as he pointed out, it's not universal, but it's not loud. Why is yeah. that? Well, I think Frank hit the nail on the head. There, there's definitely an apathy about it. I think that people feel... Um, overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. They don't know if they can really make a difference. And because of that, it causes people just to recoil and kind of do nothing. And so what Sarah and I have tried to do for the last, you know, 10 or 15 years for sure, uh, is be very intentional about waking the church up and to let them know that even though we might not solve the entire problem, if we can solve one person's life, if we can solve a village's life and their problems, if we can help them, then let's get after what we can do and not be overwhelmed by what we can't do. Well, well Pastor Steve, just quickly, just walk our folks through how you led your church into this. I mean, there had to be a starting point. How did it start? The starting point is simple. It's just being aware of the problem. And this is, I mean, this is so practical, Tony. I really want everybody to get a, a handle on this. I promise you, if you will show up and make yourself available to Jesus, I guarantee you he will open up opportunities for you and your church to go and make a difference. So become aware and then just start to act on it. 
what, whatever that looks like, back when it was easier to travel it internationally, I know when we would just show up in a country to show Christian love for our brothers and sisters, that meant almost as much as the gifts that we would bring. So be aware, show up when you can. When you can't show up, then give. Show up by giving, by supporting, and letting them know that they haven't been forgotten. So many of our beloved um, persecuted friends, our brothers and sisters, they feel like they've been forgotten. We cannot forget them. We've got to remember them in their chains, as the Apostle Paul said. Let's not be ashamed of them, but let's get after helping them tangibly pray, give, support, show up when you can, and repeat that. Just keep doing it over and over again. We'll see lives change. Share with our, our viewers that personal experience you had in, in the wake of ISIS in the Middle East. You went there, you saw the devastation. Yeah, it really was just the the trip of a lifetime in, in not a positive sense, but just um, last fall, I went with a mutual friend of ours, Tony, um, to um, deep inside of Syria, a very covert trip, and where we were able to meet with um, religious, political, and governmental leaders who had experienced just the most horrific treatment, not just by ISIS, but by the Turkish government, um, villages that have been bombed, uh, wives and daughters that had been uh, arrested and raped and sold as slaves. I mean, just the, the greatest amount of personal sadness that I've ever seen in my life and devastation hearing these people's testimonies. I mean, I don't know how you can follow Jesus and then not do something about it. How can you not get involved? How can you not write a check? How can you not speak up? How can you not call your representative, your senator? How can you not speak up for those who don't have a voice? It's, it's beyond me, but I'm grateful for your program, programs like this that are helping get the word out. We've got to remember the people that are suffering and hurting right now, and not just remember, act on their behalf. And, and folks, we certainly want to encourage you to do that because there are some great ministries that this is their focus. Open Doors, you've seen some of the videos we've played, comes from Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs. Those are two ministries that, uh, that our family personally supports. Uh, there are others that are out there that are, are, are good as well. And, and even uh, the Samaritan's Purse, uh, while they're focused on humanitarian relief, they take the gospel into places that uh, others are not able to, and they minister to those communities, and we support them a as well. Uh, uh, Pastor Steve, your experience, you've, you've been a part of helping um, those that are being persecuted for their faith come to this country and go to other countries where they can live securely. There's a lot of discussion about immigration policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, this is one area, uh, along with Turkey, that I disagreed with the previous uh, the president and had conversations with uh, him about this, uh, because I think we need to have an immigration policy, a refugee policy that allows people to come here when they're being persecuted and they have no other place to go. But there are some other problems, fundamental problems in our immigration policy uh, that you've experienced. Uh, share your thoughts with us on that. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about immigration, Tony, it's obviously a, a big, multi-layered, multi multifaceted problem. Um, I'm grateful that the scripture actually has the solution to immigration. And if we would just turn to what the scripture says, we could see that turned around in our nation. It's very, very disheartening, I must say. I was in Amman, Jordan. Uh, they're working with refugees from Mosul and have testimony from the higher ups in the UN where they knew for a fact and were reporting to me that Christians who were trying to get out of Amman and relocated into other countries, that their applications were regularly being put on the bottom of the pile and Muslims were being sent to other countries when Christians were being totally, totally forgotten about and, um, and being prejudiced against. So 
It, it's a it's a really really um, sad and even disgusting thing to see the persecution level that happens within immigration and the U.S.'s policy and coordination with the U.N. etc. It, it needs a complete overhaul. Our relationships with other countries need an overhaul in how we deal with this. Canada for years has done a much better job. Uh, I've worked with senators on this to try to get us to adopt Canada's um, approach to this, where we could have entire churches sponsoring vetted, safe, persecuted Christians, bringing them into the U.S. and then providing for them so it doesn't take any U.S. tax dollars. We could be doing that very, very easily, and yet the U.S. administrations in the in the past have not been open to that, and it's a very tragic and sad thing. We've got to let our voice be heard on that. Yeah, and it's a, it's as you said, it's a multi-layered issue, and, and it often gets jumbled up when you talk about immigration. People immediately think to the southern border, people coming across the border illegally. We're talking about uh, refugee policies that allow those that are being persecuted for their faith fully vetted, fully vetted, right. coming to this country, uh, and it is a legal means of immigrating to this country. There's a cap uh, put on this. I think currently it's maybe back up to 100,000. It was at 60,000. President Trump had it down to, I think, 18,000 um, a year. And these are people that are going to likely die where they are or suffer tremendous persecution because of their faith. And it, it, it need, we need a thoughtful policy, and it is something Great. that we do need to pray through, uh, but also advocate uh, for. Uh, Pastor Steve, I want to thank you for the work that you've done and the example you've, you've set as a pastor. I know your church has adopted uh, different families, and you've supported them who have come over. You're, you're doing what you said would be good policy. You've been acting that out, and I, I commend you for that as being an example. Would you close our time together by, by simply praying over this and praying for the church, praying for Christians that, just as you said, we would start where we are with what God gives us to do something that would make yeah. a tangible difference in the lives of those being persecuted for following Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we do right now choose to remember the persecuted and the, the troubled uh, around the world. Lord, those that are going through profoundly difficult times, Lord, we choose to remember them. We pray for them right now. God of all comfort, would you comfort them in their affliction? And God, for the church in the United States of America, may you wake us up to what's happening around the world. May we look beyond the bubble of comfort that we live in and see the big picture, see what's happening around the world. May we engage in prayer. May we engage in giving and may we engage in speaking, Lord. May we become advocates for those who are having trouble speaking up for themselves. Holy Spirit of the living God, move on the church in America to bless those that are persecuted around the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Pastor Steve, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Tony. And folks, I want to I want to encourage you to take action, to begin with prayer, praying for those that are being persecuted for their faith. And you don't need to go far to find the resources to do that. As I mentioned, there are ministries like Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors, uh, that have individuals, communities, churches that you could be praying for, that your church could adopt, your family could adopt, and just begin praying for them. And then support these ministries that are making a tangible difference in the lives of those that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And just because you don't see it in the media, the media, they're, they're not going to tell you these stories. Uh, first off, because primarily it's, it's Christians, but also religion. They don't want to talk about this. Just because you don't hear it on the cable news networks does not mean it's not happening. It is happening. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to pray for, advocate for, and help our fellow brothers and sisters, no matter what country they live in, no matter what part of the planet they may be found on, we need to be standing with them, if nothing more than in prayer. But I believe it takes more than that. 
We need to be advocating, calling upon our government to do what it can to uphold this fundamental human right of religious freedom. So I encourage you to check out the uh, websites of these various ministries that are working on this issue specifically. Again, I, I speak very highly of Open Doors and of Voice of the Martyrs, ministries that we support, that we know are they, they are doing this work. And the policy work. We're working here in our Center for International Religious Liberty to work on that issue in our nation's capital as it pertains to our public policy. But we all can pray. And that's how I want to conclude our time together tonight, praying for the persecuted and praying for next week's summit, that the Lord would use that in a way that would bring this to the attention of more Americans so that they would not only be informed, but they would take action. Father, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith, those who follow Jesus Christ, who are being persecuted for their faith. Some, Lord, are locked away alone in cells. They're in boxcars. They're in shipping containers. And Lord, they feel abandoned. I pray right now that, Lord, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would work to let them know that there are those that are advocating, praying for them. And, Lord, that those that are being stirred even now in their hearts to do more, to stand for those that have no voice. And I pray, Father, that we would see a, a resurgence of focus, of concern, of advocacy, and of effect on behalf of the persecuted around the world. And I pray for next week's summit, Lord, that it would properly and appropriately draw the attention that this issue should have among Americans, especially among believers. And Lord, may we not take the, uh, the excuses of government any longer, but Lord, may we demand that our government stand up for this fundamental human right of religious freedom. And Lord, here in this country, I pray also that for Christians here in America who are facing greater opposition, from the hostility of the left, that, Lord, we would not shrink back in silence, but we would be bold in declaring our faith, because as we do so, we make it easier for others around the world to live out their faith as well. But if we shrink back in silence and fear, Lord, many, many will suffer in persecution. So, Father, I pray you would hear our prayers and move in our land and around this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Please continue to pray. Continue to vote when you have the opportunity. By all means, keep standing.